At the beginning of the year, I really wanted to make Generation 2 more difficult, so yeah, now I'm gonna do a playthrough with Pineco, and this thing is not very good. For base stats, it has 50 HP, 65 attack, 90 defense, which is actually pretty decent. However, it has 35 special attack, 35 special defense, and 15 speed. Luckily for it, it has a medium fast growth rate, but it's a bug type, and the bug type isn't very good even in Generation 2. Plus, in true Generation 2 fashion, it learns no bug type moves. I don't know what was going through the developers' heads when they set all the Generation 2 learn sets. Honestly, I think most of them are actually worse than their Generation 1 counterparts, which is really strange. Anyways, let's talk about the moves that Pineco actually does learn. It starts off with Tackle and Protect. Then through Level Up, it learns Self Destruct, Take Down, Rapid Spin, Bide, Explosion, Spikes, and Double Edge. So yeah, these are all terrible moves for a solo challenge. After all, my rules are that I can only use my solo Pokemon in battle, and that rule sort of has an implication, which is if my Pokemon faints, I've lost the battle, so Self Destruct and Explosion won't be useful at all today. I also hate moves that deal recoil damage, because in a solo challenge, you have to last through like five or six Pokemon with only one Pokemon, so moves like Takedown and Double Edge aren't that useful either. The AI really doesn't switch their Pokemon in Generation 2, so Spikes is not that useful. I guess it can be good to do a little bit of chip damage every time they send out a new Pokemon, but that's about it. Rapid Spin is sort of just trash in this generation, it only has 20 base power. So I guess it's lucky that I'm starting with Tackle, it at least has 35 base power. I really can't wait till I make it to the forest and get Headbutt. That will be the first decent move that Pineco can actually learn. Outside of that, it does get access to Curse, Rollout, Hidden Power, which is banned in my first playthrough, Giga Drain, Solar Beam, Return, and Rest. Alright, so let's check out Pineco's back sprite. All of them in Generation 2 are quite good, and Pineco's is no different. Looks like I'm 3-hitting these wild Pokemon, which is annoying because I think I'm going to have to do a decent amount of training to be able to defeat Bugsy. After all, his Pidgeotto has Gust, and it's not Generation 1 anymore, so this is a Flying-type move. However, Pineco might be able to make it through that fight relying on its great defense stat. Anyways, we'll have to see later. For now, I have to face the rival. Of course, to make things as difficult as possible in this playthrough, he's going to take Cyndaquil as his starter. That isn't particularly impactful for this first fight since it only has a normal type move. Unfortunately, I'm not doing very much damage, but I get a critical hit on the second turn. That's nice. Also, I do have a berry, so once the Cyndaquil takes me to low health, Pineco heals itself, and that ensures that I take the win. On the way to Violet City, I make sure that I fight all of the trainers to get as much experience as is possible. I also run into a Bellsprout, I catch it. This is my Cut and Flash user. Today, I nickname it Jonathan, after one of my supporters through YouTube memberships. Thank you so much for making these videos possible. After that, I head into Sprout Tower. At the top floor, you'll see that I have 22 PP left. And after two battles, this has dropped down to 17. I figured to get the most experience possible, I would fight this one sage who is not mandatory. And then I went back downstairs, fought one sage that I had missed, just to grab a little bit more experience. And that leads me to only have 9 PP on tackle left for the final sage of the tower. Now I could go back to the Pokemon Center and heal of course, but I'm trying to do these challenges in the least possible amount of time, so I really don't like to backtrack when I don't have to. Instead, I'll just save and take the Sage on, and hopefully I'll be able to do this with only 9 uses of Tackle. One thing that's making me feel a bit tense in this fight is the fact that I only have a 95% chance to hit, but luckily I connect 3 times against the first Bellsprout and knock it out. Okay, that looks like every single Tackle is going to need to hit or I won't be able to win. After all, with self-destruct, there is no way for me to deplete its PP and then use struggle, because if I use self-destruct, Pineco faints and then I have to reset. In those cases, it feels like my HM users are the reason that I win the battle, because if you don't have any HM users and you use self-destruct, it's a tie and then you don't actually win against the trainer. Okay, so I'm really not sure if my final use of tackle is going to knock this thing out. It has like decently high orange health left over. Pineco uses tackle, luckily it hits, and the hoot hoot goes down. Okay, so I just barely was able to win that one. 
Next, of course, is the gym. I have to fight the two bird keepers in here, and with them out of the way, Pineco is now level 13. I head back to the Pokemon Center, heal up, give Pineco a berry to hold, and with that, I am ready to face Faulkner for the first time. He leads with a level 7 Pidgey. It's really annoying in a lot of playthroughs because it knows the move Mud Slap. However, I'm the Bug type and it resists ground type moves. So Faulkner is not going to be lowering my accuracy at all today. I take the first Pidgey out, taking only 3 hit points of damage in the process, and then Faulkner sends in his Ace Pidgeotto. Now this thing does have Gust, which is super effective. However, it really isn't doing very much to Pineco. My tackle is doing about a quarter, so it looks like I'm going to be able to outlast this thing. On the third turn, Pineco gets a critical hit and knocks the Pidgeotto out. That sped up my results, but I was going to win either way. So with that, I have earned myself the Zephyr Badge, a 12.5% boost to my attack stat, and the TM for Mud Slap, which, fittingly, Pineco cannot learn. I head south from Violet City, picking up the Paralyzed Cure Berry on my way. This is usually useful against Lance, so it's good to pick it up now. I also fight all the trainers on my way because I figure that Pineco is weak enough that I should just get in as much training as is possible. After all, in Johto, the level curve is all kinds of wonky. If you don't do the training, you end up just being very underleveled in the late game. Now when I'm in Union Cave, you can see that Pineco has learned the move Takedown. And here I was really hoping that I could just go to the basement floor and pick up the TM for Swift, because this would be much more preferable, after all it bypasses accuracy checks and it doesn't deal recoil damage, but unfortunately Pineco cannot learn Swift. So as I said before, I'm going to have to wait for Headbutt to get reliable damage. I finish off all the rockets in Slowpoke Well. This takes Pineco up to level 18 before I head into the gym. In here, I also defeat all of the trainers. This takes Pineco up to level 19, and with that, I'm ready to take on Bugsy. Okay, uh, as this fight starts, like, why doesn't Bugsy have a Pineco? Or like, in true Pokemon fashion, why doesn't he have two Pinecos? Like, his team would make much more sense if it was two Pinecos and a Heracross. Like, imagine if the Pinecos were just there to use self-destruct and protect and like, really ruin your day, and then the Heracross came out and that was his sweeper and it had Fury Cutter. That would be so much better than this team that they gave him. Today, I'm not really worried about Bugsy though, because Pineco has a great strategy against him. After I finish off the cocoons, his ace Scyther comes out, and its signature move, of course, is Fury Cutter. It relies on being able to hit consistently to stack up its power. However, I have Protect, so I can just alternate between attacking and using Protect, and this way Fury Cutter is going to do very little damage. Because I have a berry, I can restore my health, that means I'm not too worried about using Takedown, and because of that, I'm able to take the Scyther out. Alright, so it feels good to have defeated Bugsy, the Bug-type gym leader. This gives me a 12.5% boost to all my Bug-type moves, which of course, Pineco can learn none of. Very frustrating, especially because Bugsy gives me Fury Cutter, like the only bug TM. Come on, Game Freak. After that, I head outside of the gym, and then it's sunk in. The rival has a Ghastly and all four of my moves are normal type moves. Now, remember how self-destruct works. If you use it, your Pokemon faints. At this point in the game, I can't buy any revives, so I genuinely thought for a moment that this was the end of the run. If I can't deplete self-destruct's PP, then there's no way for me to use struggle, and I won't be able to knock the ghastly out. However, of course this isn't the end of the run. I can just level up to level 22 where I learn Rapid Spin. Because this is the fifth move that Pineco learns, I can teach it in the place of self-destruct, and now I can deplete all of my PP so that I can use struggle against the rival. In the comments of one of my previous videos, someone mentioned that I use the word frustration a lot. They politely requested, of course, that I buy myself a thesaurus. So uh, yeah, luckily I have an internet connection, so let's look up some synonyms for frustration. Uh, annoyance, dissatisfaction, grievance, irritation, resentment. I also really like uh, disgruntlement or uh, vexation. I think all of these words are quite fitting for how I feel about having to deplete my PP when I have a move like rapid spin. You can use this move 40 times. So like, yes, I will be able to progress with the playthrough, 
but first I have to battle a lot of really awful wild Pokemon. One thing that I was worried about in doing this is what if those Pokemon deal enough damage to me and I'm not able to heal it? That might mean at some point if I run out of money and healing items that I'm not able to battle the rival at full health. That would honestly be such a downer and it might actually end up foiling me entirely in this playthrough. Okay, so finally, after a total real time of over 30 minutes, I am now ready to face the rival in Azalea Town. Honestly, I sort of resent how this has gone to this point, but I won't have a long-term grievance if I get by the rival on my first attempt. Luckily, Struggle knocks the Ghastly out in a single hit, so that's good. The main problem has now been circumvented. However, next he sends in Quilava, and uh, yeah, that's a bit of a bitter pill to swallow. I go for Struggle, it does less than half. Quilava strikes back with a super effective Ember, taking Pineco under half. I take it down to red health next, and then Quilava uses Leer? Okay, uh, not really sure what he's trying to do there. Maybe he's just trying to fizzle out. I use Struggle, knock Quilava out, and then he sends in Zubat. Okay, I'm like pretty sure that I'm gonna do this. Zubat uses Bite, it does 5 damage. Okay, it causes Pineco to flinch, that's annoying. It goes for Bite again, which causes a second flinch. That is really irritating. And then luckily for me, on the next turn, its third bite does not cause a flinch. I go for struggle, but this fails to knock the Zubat out just barely. And the recoil damage that Pineco takes puts it at two hit points, meaning that Zubat's next bite causes me to be defeated. All right, that is a serious drag. But what if the Quilava just keeps using Ember? And in that case, I'm gonna lose. Making matters worse is the fact that Ghastly can put me to sleep at the beginning of the fight. This way it does chip damage to me with Lick, making Pineco have even less health left for the Quilava. This means that I can do less damage with Struggle, and so it makes the fight basically impossible. Another problem that can happen at the beginning of the fight is the Ghastly can paralyze me with Lick. This is really annoying not because of the speed, but because there is a chance that I will not attack. If I miss one attack, then I'm just not going to do enough damage and there's no hope for me against Quilava. So, I guess I just need to swallow this bitter pill. It is so frustrating that I'm going to have to heal Pineco, replenishing all of my PP. And by doing this, I am once again going to be able to train. But how many levels will I really need? The Ghastly on the rival's team has 27 speed, so if I take Pineco up to level 26, then it will have a speed tie against it. I'd rather have a coin flip to move first. I can also make things a little bit more consistent by giving Pineco the paralyzed cure berry that I mentioned earlier on. So let's try the rival again at this level and see how it goes. Unfortunately, on the first turn, Ghastly wins the speed tie, uses Lick, and successfully paralyzes Pineco. Luckily, the berry's there to heal me, I use Struggle, and it knocks Ghastly out. Okay, it's time for the Quilava. Hopefully, I'm able to do half damage to this thing. It uses Ember, doing about a quarter to me. I use Struggle, taking it down to half health. Alright, that's good. It goes for Ember again. I survive with 17 hit points, and then my next Struggle takes it out. Alright, that's perfect. I have 11 hit points left over for the Zubat, though, and I just don't think that's enough. I go for Struggle. It doesn't knock the bat out. Pineco survives with three hit points, but Zubat's bite finishes me off again. However, if I win the speed tie against Ghastly, then I knock it out with Struggle and don't take any chip damage from Lick. This means I'm going to make it past the Quilava with more health. In this case, I actually only have one more hit point, which is not particularly promising against the Zubat. Now we saw in the last fight that Struggle is not going to one hit this thing, but in this case, Pineco is so fed up that it gets a critical hit and knocks Zubat out. However, I have to survive the recoil damage, and Pineco just barely does this, hanging on with three hit points. So with almost 45 minutes on the clock, I have finished the rival in Azalea Town, and I am now ready to move on to the forest. Here, Pineco gets access to Headbutt, a reliable, damage-dealing move with a 30% chance to flinch, and I'm not going to have to deal recoil damage to myself anymore. I really think that that deserves a celebration. And luckily for Pineco, it's going to get it in the form of some excellent items coming up in the next section of the game. Obviously in Goldenrod City, I have to do the regular errands, so I go to the underground picking up the coin case. This allows me to buy an Abra so that I can use teleport later on in the playthrough. After that, I grab Kenya. By the way, I'll note here as I head north that I am not using the bike. I have just banned it from my Generation 2 playthroughs to ensure consistency across the board because I wasn't using it earlier on. Plus, it doesn't 
doesn't really speed up your movement that much. It is not nearly as fast as the Generation 1 or Generation 3 bikes. Now, following up with all the training that I was doing in the earlier portions of the game, I am going to continue that here. And perhaps against my better judgment, I decided to face Fire Breather Walt. He has two Magmar, and they both know Ember and Fire Punch, which could be incredibly bad for Pineco. Also, I'm quite low on Headbutt PP. Luckily, I knocked the first Magmar out in a single hit. The second one comes in, it is a higher level. It hits Ember, taking me under half health, but it looks like I'll survive one more hit. I go for Headbutt and finish it off. With that, Pineco levels up to level 29 and has the chance to learn the incredible move Bide. I find it really ironic that it learns this move when its evolution is a Steel type, and Steel type types notoriously take very little damage, so like, you're gonna pay back even less just because of that. Today, Bide's not gonna be useful, so I say no. Now, let's talk about the items that are gonna be useful for Pineco. In the National Park, I talk to this girl who's sitting on a bench. She gives me the Quick Claw. This is hopefully gonna help me mitigate my speed problems. After that, on the former route, I can pick up TM-04, which is Rollout. So while I didn't have access to Fury Cutter, at least I'll have access to this move. I head to Whitney's Gym next, fighting all of the trainers in here. By the way, I have a question. Do you take this route that I always take where you go up first, then over to the side and down? Or do you go right and then fight the girl with the Meowth? I'm genuinely curious which path people take. I've always done it this way and I never really considered that you could go the other direction. Okay, so with that question out of the way, let's take on Whitney. Up first is Clefairy, which in the past has got Parish Song and Self-Destruct with Metronome, but today it gets Growl. I guess that is actually useful because it's lowering my attack stat by one stage. However, I've set up Rollout, so I should do massive damage to the Mill Tank. Rollout knocks her lead out on the second turn, the cow comes in, and Rollout misses. Are you kidding me? Okay, so Mill Tank now has a chance to set up its rollout, and this is very bad because Pineco is weak to rock type moves. As a result, I'm just taking too much damage, not dealing enough damage myself, and Pineco goes down. I'm pretty sure if I don't miss against the Mill Tank that I will win. Okay, let's see what Clefairy's Metronome gets. Oh, in this case it gets Jump Kick. It's really good I'm not a normal type. In this case it only does one damage to me, and then I finish it off with rollout. Okay, please don't miss. In this case I don't, I do more than half to the mill tank, it strikes back with rollout, doing a little bit, my next one connects, and with that, I've defeated Whitney. Now strangely enough, defeating the normal type gym leader is actually a really big benefit to Pineco, because I get a 12.5% boost to my speed stat, as well as a 12.5% boost to all normal type moves. Ugh, it is so ironic that the type based boost from Bugsy was less useful than the type based boost from Whitney. I guess this is generation 2 and here normal types reign supreme. Of course in all my first playthroughs, I require myself to defeat the pseudo Wudo. It's actually not that hard, it does have a rock type move in the form of rock throw, but its AI is random, so it never chooses it, and I easily defeat it. After that, on Route 36, I pick up the Hardstone. I probably should have picked this up before. I would have been doing a little bit more damage to Whitney, but I just forgot. I head into Ecritique City next. By the way, over by this little, like, lake or pond or whatever it is, there is a hidden Hyper Potion. After that, I head out onto Route 39, fighting a lot of trainers on the way just to level up. I pick up the Mint Berry, as well as this hidden Nugget. And then instead of heading back to the Burned Tower, I'm gonna go to Olivine City. This is so I can do some errands here, grabbing the Good Rod, catching myself a Krabby. By the way, there is a Krabby playthrough coming to the channel very soon in Pokemon Yellow. That one has actually been very highly requested, and I actually did a playthrough of it last summer, but I just never released it. By the way, it takes way longer to produce these videos than it does to film them. Now, I came to Olivine City not just to catch Pokemon, but also to complete the Lighthouse, because this is going to give Pineco a lot more levels, and what I'm really hoping for here is a high enough speed stat to move first against at least some of the ghosts. I don't want Morty's lead Ghastly to get a curse off on the first turn. With that finished off, I head back to Ecritique City. I have occasionally forgotten the Kimono Girls, so I should do them now. Here I have a chance to learn Explosion, which I am gonna say no to. After that, I pick up the HM for Surf, and now I'm ready to take on the rival in Burn Tower. Unfortunately for me, his lead Haunter has 48 speed, so the only way I'm gonna move first is with the Quick Claw, and I luckily get it, so that's really nice. 
By the way, you might think, why not use Protect to block Curse? But it actually doesn't work that way. Curse bypasses Protect. So I do have the awful status condition, but it does cause the Haunter to faint, meaning I take no damage on the first turn. Next is Quilava. It outspeeds, hitting Ember, but it only does like a quarter. My rollout is very powerful at this point, so I knock it out. I move on to the Magnemite. I'm locked into rollout at this point, so I have to hit it. It doesn't quite finish it off. I take curse damage and sonic boom damage. However, the only Pokemon the rival has left now is Zubat. It comes out, rollout continues, and I finish it off. So with that battle out of the way, it is now time to face Morty. However, before this fight, I have to make a choice about which item I want Pineco to hold. The Quick Claw, the Hard Stone, or the Mint Berry. Morty's first Ghastly only has 41 speed, so I don't need the Quick Claw to move first against it. The Hard Stone might boost my damage, allowing me to knock it out. So I'm going to go with this, at least for my first fight. Now remember back in Burn Tower when I said Protect doesn't block Curse? Yeah, I didn't know that when I was doing this playthrough, so here we get to see this interaction play out. I use Protect against the Ghastly, it goes for Curse, cuts its HP, and yeah, puts a Curse on me, so that's really annoying. I go for Rollout on the next turn, finishing it off, luckily bypassing all Curse damage. Next is Haunter, it hits Nightshade, and my second turn of Rollout knocks it out. Okay, so... Please, Gengar, just miss Hypnosis. But instead it goes for Mean Look, which is pretty useless, Rollout hits, and Gengar goes down. Because of that, I think I've got it. And then Morty's next Haunter once again sets up Mean Look. Like, ah, oh, what a bad play. Anyways, I knock it out, and with that, I've earned myself the fourth badge. Now, sometimes in these playthroughs, it's hard to get a sense for exactly how much you should be training. Of course, to minimize the amount of real time, it is best to skip all training. However, with Pineco, there are a lot of opponents in the late game that I am very scared for, so I'm going to continue my training out at sea. By the way, there are so many trainers here, we've put together this super cut of it, just removing all of the battles for convenience. I really like this route that I take, it's like, go south, fight all the trainers, then go left, then go down, then go right, then go down, and then go left again. After all of this, I'm going to arrive right next to the Pokemon Center and be able to heal, which is really convenient. So now let's talk about the opponents that I'm really worried about with Pineco. Basically, it's any trainer that has the move Flamethrower. So Karen's Houndoom, Lance's Charizard, Blue's Arcanine, and Red's Charizard. Unfortunately for me, all these Pokemon are really fast, so I do think I'm going to be relying on the Quick Claw. Well, with all this training under my belt, Pineco is now level 41, so let's head into the gym. I don't expect this place to be very hard. After all, fighting types deal physical damage in Generation 2. That is, except for this Hitmonchan, it does have special moves, but in this case it just goes for Comet Punch. After that it goes for Ice Punch, which could freeze, but it doesn't, and I knock it out. So with the tag team trainers out of the way, now it's time to face Chuck. Up first is Primeape, I don't outspeed it, it uses Leer, Pineco hits Headbutt, gets a critical hit, and Primeape goes down on turn 1. So that is really great. Next is Poliwrath, it sets up Mind Reader. By the way, this will not ensure that Hypnosis hits. There is a 25% debuff to the AI's accuracy on any status move. Unfortunately, Mind Reader does not bypass this check. However, even with this programming gimmick, Pineco has a way to play around Mind Reader because it can just use Protect, and that foils Polyrath's Hypnosis. Unfortunately, it just goes for Hypnosis again on the next turn, and despite not having Mind Reader, it does connect, and uh, Pineco goes to sleep, so that's really annoying. Luckily, I wake up early. By the way, I'm speed tied with the Polyrath, so all that training was useful. I win the tie, or the Quick Claw activates, I move first, hit Headbutt, and flip the Polyrath. Then I move first on the next turn, and Polyrath goes down. Alright, so that was a very easy fifth badge. And because the reward for this badge is the HM for Fly, I head back to Newbark Town. I'm doing this so that I can pick up the Pink Bow. By the way, you can only obtain this item after you've defeated Falkner, and I usually don't like wasting the time backtracking here earlier on. After that, I fly to the Lake of Rage, defeating the Red Gyarados, and now it's time for the Rocket Plotline. Because I spent so much time fighting the rival in Azalea Town, let's just use the powers of video editing to skip through all of that. 
Thanks, Lance. And with that, let's head into Price's Gym. Now, usually I don't train in here, but today I'll do a little bit just to take Pineco up to level 47. So now it's time for Price. No need for an introduction for him. I think I can just use Rollout and sweep his team. Seal goes down with two hits. Because Rollout is really powerful at this point, I one hit the Dugong. Piloswine's next. It does take neutral damage. It actually has two more speed than Pineco, so it moves first, hits Blizzard. Luckily, it doesn't do very much, and it also doesn't freeze me. Like, ah, price is so bad. Unfortunately, rollout misses, which is not very nice. So I decide instead of setting up rollout again, I'll just go for headbutt and knock the pile of swine out. Things slow down a little bit, I use protect to block a blizzard, and then price heals with a hyper potion, but I still manage to get two headbutts in and finish the pile of swine off. Okay, so, uh, yeah, you know who's next. It is Jasmine, and, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Like, I have Headbutt, Protect, Rollout, and Takedown. Uh, maybe Rollout can make some miracles happen, but I'm not optimistic. Okay, cue the intro because she really deserves it. She leads with Magnemite. Now, this is probably the Pokemon that improved the most between Generation 1 and Generation 2. I go for Protect first turn to block Thunder Wave so it can't paralyze me. It really likes to do this on turn one. After that, I strike with Rollout doing about a fifth. After that, Magnemite hits Thunderbolt, gets a critical hit, and does more than half to Pineco. Are you kidding? Like, this is not gonna be possible. My next Rollout doesn't knock it out. I get paralyzed, it hits another Thunderbolt, taking me to red health. While I do finish off her lead, she just sends in Steelix next. I was like, okay, maybe I'll see how much damage it does, but Steelix goes for Iron Tail, Pineco doesn't survive, and that's my first loss. I tried again, but things really are not going well. I am under half health by the time Steelix comes out. I managed to hit Rollout, but it does like so little damage, and Jasmine has a Hyper Potion, so I don't think that this is going to be possible. Now in Generation 2, the Gym Leader's Pokemon are usually the gender of the Gym Leader, so I figured that Jasmine's Steelix would be a female Steelix. I taught Pineco Attract in the place of Takedown because of this, but as soon as I got back into the fight, I realized that, no, Steelix is a male Steelix. Like, okay, fine, I guess I can't use Attract strategies to win, so that's another loss. I honestly don't think this is going to be possible, I need to do more training, so let's backtrack, fight all of the trainers that I skipped, which honestly is not that many. There are some that appear at the Lake of Rage after you finish the Rocket plotline, so I can polish them off. After that, I go over to the secret place, fight the three cool trainers there. Then I go to the department store. Here, I really want to draw your attention to the bottom left of the screen. You can see the number of vitamins that I can still feed to Pineco at this point. So the fact that I've done so much training throughout this run means that I can actually use less vitamins now. This is because as you train, you gain stat experience. And once you reach 25,600 stat experience in each stat, you can no longer feed vitamins. So because Pineco doesn't learn any move tutor moves, and it can't learn any of the TMs from the game corner, I might as well spend all my money now to improve my stats just a little bit. After that I grab the TM for return, obviously this is going to be doing better damage than Headbutt, and uh, then I head back into the Jasmine fight, so uh, not really sure what to tell you here, like maybe return will do? Okay, actually return does a decent amount to the Magnemites, I can't believe that. I finished the first one off without getting paralyzed, so that means I am going to move first against the Steelix in this battle. Now if you didn't really know, Iron Tail is not known for its accuracy or its PP, so if the Steelix misses enough, and if I use Protect occasionally, I should be able to knock the Steelix out eventually. Also, Return is doing a decent amount of damage. Unfortunately for me, the side effect of Iron Tail is that it can lower your defense, so this happens, causing the Steelix to do massive damage with a critical hit, and as a result, Pineco goes down just before it finishes the Steelix off. Okay, um, back to training. Let's level up. If I go over two more damage rounding thresholds to level 53, I think that then maybe I'll be able to do it. In this case, I just get really lucky because I get a crit against the Magnemite, so I move on to the Steelix. Okay, that was great. Please don't mess this up for me. Now Return is doing what looks like a sixth. I take an Iron Tail and ah, oh, it gets a critical hit and lowers my defense. Are you kidding me? Okay, so check this out. After Jasmine uses her Hyper Potion, her Steelix misses not one, but two screeches. And as a result, I am finally able to finish it off. However, the battle's not done because she still has one more Magnemite and I only have 40 hit points left over. I go for Protect first turn because it is going to use Thunder Wave. This effectively counters her strategy. And then I go for Return and uh, yeah, level 53 with the Pink Bow. This move does enough damage to one hit the Magnemite. 
So I have defeated Jasmine at long last. By the way, my time now is approaching two hours. So Pineco is probably going to earn itself one of the bottom spots of the tier list. Uh, yeah, this is a terrible performance so far. Uh, why do I uh, do this to myself? I have to do an optimized version with this thing. So <laughs> this is, we're only just getting started. In the radio tower, I fight this executive. He has six Pokemon. He has five coughing and one wheezing. By the way, I've commissioned art for him because he is annoying in some playthroughs, but luckily not today for Pineco. In the underground, I have to face the rival, and strangely enough, in this fight, his Quilava has not evolved to a Typhlosion. It is the only starter that has not yet evolved. So yeah, he's not a problem. At the end of the second part of Radio Tower, I am going to face the executive who has a Houndoer and a Houndoom. I was a bit worried about him. The Houndoom does move first, but it uses Ember. Actually gets a critical hit, doing a lot of damage. Luckily, Pineco survives. I get a chance to use Return, and the Houndoom goes down. Okay, so with that, the Rocket Plotline is done, and I can proceed through Ice Path. I make sure that I pick up Rest here. I think this will be useful later on. I also grab a PP up, and then I head into the Blackthorn Gym to face Claire. Okay, so let's see how much damage Return is dealing against her Dragonairs. And it looks like I can at least roll for the one hit. Okay, the second Dragonair, let's see if I can get a consistent range. And it looks like it is, so she shouldn't be a problem today. By the way, in Generation 2, every trainer class has a DV spread allocated to it. So for instance, all of Claire's Dragonairs, which are the same level, all have the exact same stats. The only thing that's actually different about these Dragonairs is the moves that they know. Last, she sends in her Ace Kingdra. It is faster than Pineco by only 4 speed. It hits Surf, doing about a quarter. I go for return, which takes it all the way down to red health. Unfortunately, this triggers a hyper potion, delaying my win just a little bit. However, I get two more returns in and finish her off. So with that, I have completed all eight gyms in Johto. Before the league, I have to fight the rival again. He's really not that challenging in this fight. Yes, he does have a magneton, and I'm gonna have to use return against it. And here, I just really want to point out once again how terrible Pineco's move pool is. Like, why does it have no bug moves? Why does it have no steel moves. They gave it spikes, so like maybe it should have some ground moves. I don't know. I guess it gets grass moves in the form of Giga Drain and Solar Beam, and like I could be using Solar Beam in combination with Sunny Day, but my special attack stat is so bad, so like I really didn't think that that was going to be the best strategy. All right, so this rival fight is wrapping up. I luckily was able to defeat him with only Return and Rollout. So now with a level 63 Pineco, Let's take on the Elite Four. Alright, so Will's up first. It's really good that his Zatu does not have any flying type moves. I find that very strange. Like, it has Quick Attack and Future Sight, like not Wing Attack or Fly, like come on. <laughs> Probably should have one of those moves. Actually, does Zatu learn either of those moves? I, I gotta look it up, just one second. Okay, so in Generation 2, the only flying type moves that Zatu can learn are Peck and Fly. That playthrough is not going to be very fun because if it wants to learn Psychic, it has to learn this move at level 65. <laughs> oh dear. I should note here that Zatu can learn Drill Peck, but that's only an egg move. Its father has to either be a Firo or a Dodrio. All right, so I thought I was buying time because this fight was going to be easy, but then Slowbro takes about a third, sets up Curse, meaning it takes like way less now. Then it goes for Psychic, taking me down to orange health. I don't knock it out, of course, and it finishes Pineco off. Alright, so in my last video with Teddy Ursa, I really struggled against Will, and normally that's not the case. Like, I think that might have been the first time that Will actually put up a significant fight. I really hope that things are not going to repeat themselves here with Pineco. And uh, yeah, they are, because Pineco gets confused. As a result, I get knocked out by Will's first Zatu. Things are looking a little bit grim for this pinecone bagworm. So like, please Will, let me pass because uh, I have rollout. It's super effective against your ace. Like, I should be able to do this. In the next battle, I take the slow bro out, move on to the executor. It actually takes a lot of damage from return, so I finish it off. He did set up reflect, which is a bit annoying. However, all that's left is a jinx and oh great, lovely kiss, are you kidding me? Yeah, the jinx is faster, has 93 speed, Pineco has 85 speed, so that's a problem. I don't wake up and the jinx finishes me off. Three losses to Will, that is not good. 
So I think I'm gonna need to do some training, but there's a problem with this because I've basically defeated every trainer in Johto. Also in Victory Road, there are a lot of rock types and I don't have anything that's particularly good against them. So instead of training here, I have to backtrack all the way to this little patch of grass. Luckily there's this house beside it with a woman inside who will heal you. That is very convenient because I might be here for a while. Now level 63 was a damage rending threshold. So if I go to level 68, then I'll be doing significantly more damage damage, and maybe that will give me the win against Will. But more critical than the fact that this increases my damage, it also allows me to outspeed the first Zatu. Now Return gets the one hit, so that's perfect, no more confusion shenanigans from this thing. Will sends in his second Zatu, we're speed tied, I lose it, and uh, yeah, confusion shenanigans right here, just great. This is uh, slightly irritating. Pineco hits itself once, then I strike back with Return, and it gets a critical hit knocking Will's ace out. Okay, so now it's time for the Jinx. Unfortunately, I hit myself, Jinx uses Psychic, and then I knock it out. Okay, time for the Executor. I go for a turn, it gets the one hit. Okay, I've almost done this, let's do it. Slowbro's last, I hit return, it takes it down to red health. Slowbro hits a Psychic, nice, I survive, and as a result, I have finally defeated Will. Okay, Koga's next. This one should not be that hard because I do have rollout. The Ariados is first. I decided just to use return on it because it likes to set up double team and I didn't want to fail to knock it out. Venomoth is next. This thing is definitely a rock fire type, so I have to be careful, but luckily return does enough and I take it down. Koga sends in Crobat. It goes for double team, raising its evasion. Return hits and actually gets the KO. All right, so all of my training is paying off. I'm over leveled now. Fortress is next. I could use rollout but you know might as well just take it out with three returns finally it's time for muck and i take care of it with a single return so i'm moving on to bruno now bug type resists fighting type pokemon so this shouldn't be too hard also as a result of this type pairing the hitmonchan isn't going to use priority mock punch so i take it out for free unfortunately the onyx that follows is a bit annoying it has rock slide which is super effective also sandstorm does a lot of damage in generation 2 and i have to take it out with return which takes three turns after it goes down and bruno sends in machamp i have just under half health remaining luckily the sandstorm damages the champ just slightly and I'm hoping that this is going to give me the one hit with return because I really don't want to take a rock slide. And in this case, I get the damage roll I need and Machamp goes down. Hitmonlee is last. Even though it's his second Pokemon, he chooses to send it in last because it only has fighting type moves. Also, it has very low defense, so Return is easily able to finish it off. And with that, I have made it to what might be the scariest Elite Four member. Let's face Karen. Okay, so Umbreon's first, and I almost never one-hit this thing, but I get a lucky critical hit and take it down. Next, Karen chooses to send in Houndoom, because the AI recognizes that it has Flamethrower and that's super effective. It outspeeds, and does more than half. Luckily, Return does enough damage, and I am able to take it down. Okay, it's time for the Vileplume. I move first, and knock it out with a single return. And now against Gengar, I'm gonna have to use Rollout to take it down. Unfortunately though, I'm not able to take it out with two hits from Rollout, giving Gengar enough time to set up both Curse, and then use Destiny Bond against Pineco, so that is an annoying reset. In the next battle, I make it back to Gengar, and once again it takes me out with Destiny Bond. Ah, oh, that's so irritating. And it doesn't have to rely on Destiny Bond because it can also just take me out with Curse, which is what happens in the next fight. All right, so I think it's time for a moveset change up. Let's add Rest in the place of Attract. Because I'm consistently surviving Houndoom's Flamethrower, that means I'm always making it to the Vileplume, sometimes with my accuracy lowered, sometimes without. Now, because the Vileplume doesn't really have anything that it can do to Pineco, I think that using Rest here to replenish my health before the Gengar is the best move. I finish the Vileplume off with one hit from Return, Gengar comes out, it uses Curse, cutting its HP, and then it looks like my rollout is going to take it out with two hits. Okay, so it doesn't use Destiny Bond, it goes for Lick, but ah, uh, rollout just misses. Are you kidding me? And then on the next turn, Gengar goes for Destiny Bond and Pineco goes down. In the next fight, I was a bit sloppy and I forgot to heal on the Vileplume, so I don't have good health for the Gengar, and this is the first time that I take it out. 
Ah, uh, but I did get paralyzed, meaning I can't outspeed the Murkrow, so it's able to finish me off with a combination of faint attack and curse damage. Now, I did mention that I'm consistently making it to the Vile Plume, but that isn't really true because the Umbreon can sometimes use Confuse Ray, and then against the Houndoom, I hit myself, and that causes a loss. Also, it is possible for the Houndoom to just get a critical hit and one-shot Pineco. That happens in the next fight. So these battles against Karen are really not going well. It feels here like I made that mistake with Rest and then I got punished for it. So will I be able to defeat her if I remember Rest? Well, here's how it goes. Against the Vileplume, I was confused, but this doesn't prevent Rest. That's really good. Pineco wakes up, snaps out of confusion, and knocks Vileplume out. Okay, it's time for the Gengar. I know I can take this thing out this time. Strangely, Gengar reverses its turn order. It goes for Lick first, then uses Curse, which is way better for me, and this allows me to take it out with Rollout. All that's left is the Murkrow. I'm still rolling, move first, and take it down. So Pineco has made it to the champion. Now we get to see how this weak bug type goes up against a team of flying type Pokemon. Luckily the Gyarados doesn't have any flying type moves, and it loves to use Rain Dance on the first turn, giving me the freedom to set up Rollout and knock it out. Okay, so now I'm onto my third Rollout for the Aerodactyl. However, it's fast and it can hit with Rock Slide first, doing actually not very much. My Rollout connects, gets a critical hit, and Aerodactyl goes down. Next, Lance chooses to send in Charizard, of course. It goes for Flamethrower, and because the rain is up, it does very little damage, Pineco has about half health remaining, I hit Rollout and Charizard faints. So there's only the Dragonites left over. I guess the level 51 does have Fire Blast, so I should be worried about it. Of course Lance chooses it next, but surprisingly I have one more speed than it, so Pineco moves first, hits Rollout, and Dragonite goes down. That's probably because this is the fifth Rollout and uh, its effective power is over three digits. So now I have to start using Rollout again on the next Dragonite. It hits with Thunder, I take it out on the second turn, and now because I'm rolling, unless I miss, I should have this. I don't, and Lance's last Pokemon faints. So Pineco defeated the Elite Four with a time of 2 hours and 40 minutes. Honestly, not a particularly good performance, this thing is going very slow, I've had to do so much training, but I'm very surprised by the fact that Lance was not actually that difficult. Perhaps Red won't be that bad either. However, to get there, I have to smash my way through a bunch of Kanto Gym Leaders. I catch myself a Snorlax, I always use the Master Ball on this thing. By the way, I do know that there's a Leftovers in Celadon City. I'm not really sure which one is faster, catching the Snorlax and taking its Leftovers. You have to fight the Snorlax anyways, so I choose to do this. I'm pretty sure speedrunners take the Leftovers from Celadon City. After finishing off Janine, who is the last of the Kanto Gym Leaders that I face, I backtrack to Viridian City to face Blue. Now his team is a bit scary because of the Arcanine, but I'm cautiously optimistic here. After all, he does have a Gyarados that loves to set up Rain Dance. Before the fight, I take some time to teach Pineco Curse in the place of Protect, and now I'm ready. Blue's lead is Pidgeot. Now here's my strategy. The combination of Pineco's already high defense, Curse's setup, Rest, and the Leftovers is going to allow me to essentially set up for free against it. While this does cut my speed, my speed was already terrible, so I don't think it really matters. After setting up, my attack is 801 and my defense is nearly maxed. Now, Return gets a one hit on the Pidgeot. Blue chooses to send in Rhydon next. It does resist my attacks and it has a super effective Rock Slide. Return almost takes it out despite being resisted. I really didn't want to lock myself into Rollout. I finish it off on the next turn, and Blue sends in Arcanine. Okay, I was kind of hoping that he would choose the Gyarados first, but it makes sense that he chose this one. It gets a Flamethrower off, Pineco survives, okay, that's exactly what I needed, and I take Arcanine down with my next hit. However, Sandstorm is chipping away at me, I have very little health left, and because the Gyarados knows that it can get a KO, it just attacks and finishes Pineco off. So I felt that I might need an alternate strategy here. I tried the fight without setting up Curse to retain my speed and use Rollout, but this really doesn't go well. Also, the Gyarados still has more speed than Pineco, so even if I was able to take the Arcanine out, I would lose. I do a bit of training, taking Pineco up over the next damage rounding threshold to level 80, and then I attempt Blue again with the Rollout strategy. 
but this once again ends in a loss, this time because Blue used a full restore. Alright, so let's go back to the setup strategy. This way I can one-shot the Arcanine. I survive with much more health now. As a result, I'm able to tank the Gyarados' Hydro Pump and finish it off. Executor is next. It takes in Sunlight for Solar Beam, which is going to be absolutely useless against me. Also, I just finish it off with one return, and all that's left is Alakazam. Strangely enough, it doesn't even try to attack, it just sets up Reflect, and even with the screen on its side, Return is still able to get the one hit. Alright, so that's it. I've made it to red, and to this point I haven't used any of my rare candies. Yes, I have trained so much. Pineco is level 80 but now I can use all of them and take it all the way up to level 90. So will this be enough to defeat the toughest trainer in all of Generation 2? Let's see. His first Pokémon is Pikachu. Now, usually this thing can't do that much damage, so setting up Curse here is typically a good choice because then I should one-hit all of the other Pokémon on his team. After all, Pineco started this fight with 129 speed, so it isn't moving first against the Espeon, the Venusaur, the Charizard, or even the Blastoise. However, in this attempt, I pushed things a little bit too far against the Pikachu. I figured that I would survive one more Thunder, but I don't, so Pineco goes down. Obviously at this point, Rollout isn't very useful anymore, so let's go with the most Generation 2 moveset and teach Sleep Talk in its place. In this case, I time my Rest a little bit better against the Pikachu, heal up with Rest, and then I start using Sleep Talk, it selects Curse, and then selects Rest again, healing me once again to full health. But at plus 3 attack, Sleep Talk selects Return, hits Pikachu, and it faints. Okay, so it's time for the Charizard. Oh, uh... He chooses Venusaur? I'm really confused about this. Is his AI thinking like, I'll set up Sunny Day or something? Well, it's clearly not thinking that because Venusaur just goes for Solar Beam, takes in Sunlight. I wake up, hit Return, and Venusaur goes down. All right, now it's time for the Charizard. Of course, it outspeeds, hits Flamethrower, and takes Pineco out. So, I want all of you to prepare for the absolute pain that is this fight. Sometimes I make mistakes on Pikachu, and it takes me out with Thunder. Other times I make it back to the Charizard, get outsped, it hits with Flamethrower when I'm at full health, and uh, yeah, this takes Pineco out without a critical hit. So even if I leveled Pineco up to level 100 and maxed out its stat experience, I doubt that it would be able to outspeed the Charizard, because that thing has 179 speed. If it's one hitting at level 90, it's probably going to one hit at level 100, do note that my special attack stat is getting the badge boost, but my special defense stat isn't. This is very unfortunate. My special attack stat before the badge boost would have to be over 206 to give my special defense a boost. So even leveling up to level 100 won't give Pineco the additional special defense. So what can I do to solve the Charizard? Well, I could level up to level 100, which would take a long time, and then hopefully, like just fingers crossed, I would survive the flamethrower. Or I could use the Quick Claw, move first against the Charizard, and get a one hit with Return. So because I really don't want to level up, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to take out the rest of his team if I defeat the Charizard, let's go for the Quick Claw strategy. All right, so cue the montage. In my first attempt, Flamethrower takes me out. It uh, takes me out my second attempt, and in my third, and in my fourth, <laughs> and in my fifth. Like, this is not looking good. In Generation 2, this item has a 23% chance to activate, so I should get it sometime soon. In the next fight, I make it past the Venusaur again. That's basically happening in every battle now. Against Charizard, I select Return, Quick Claw activates, I hit, and the Fiery Lizard goes down. However, I've made it to the Snorlax with only 39 hit points remaining. I was really worried here that Snorlax would choose Body Slam and knock me out. However, because my defense has been boosted so much from Curse, the Snorlax knows that it can't get a KO, so it chooses Amnesia to set up instead. That gives Pineco the time it needs to use Rest, recovering all of its health, and so the fight continues. Unfortunately for me, the Snorlax gets both a critical hit and a paralysis against Pineco, so I'm forced to heal up a second time with Rest. But after that, I am healthy and I am ready to defeat Red. Let's do this. I think I actually might clock in under 3 hours and 30 minutes. It's not a good time, but it's nice, I guess. However, in this case, Snorlax moves first, uses Body Slam, paralyzes Pineco, cutting my speed to 7, which is just basically an insult at this point. Return hits, and Snorlax goes down. Okay, so he only has two Pokemon left. 
Next is Blastoise. It hits Surf, taking me just under half health. Return connects, and the turtle goes down. So now it's time for his final Pokemon. It's Espeon. Unfortunately for me, though, this thing just chooses Psychic, which is a special attack, and Pyco fades. I uh, cannot state to you how bad this felt. Do I actually need the Quick Claw to activate against both the Charizard and the Espeon? Well, I might be able to survive Psychic from the Espeon if I have green health, but to test that, I am going to need to defeat the Charizard first. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it knocks me out over and over and over again. Sometimes I also make mistakes against the Venusaur, and then it takes me out with Solar Beam. So at this point in the playthrough, I'm not sure if you can tell, but I was getting quite tired. It is very mentally taxing to be this focused for three and a half hours. Yeah, by the way, I am not going to clock in under three and a half hours of time. In this battle, I make it past the Charizard, but with only 23 hit points remaining. I was like, maybe Snorlax is going to go for the Body Slam this time, but it once again doesn't, so I'm able to heal. Okay, this is looking good. I am hopeful now that I'm going to be able to test full health against the Espeon. So what I can do here is, after I knock the Snorlax out, against the Blastoise, I can use Rest. This way I will heal to full health, and now I'm just hoping that Sleep Talk is going to select either Return or Rest. By doing that, it is going to either attack or heal, but it could choose Curse, and in that case I'll just waste a turn. Luckily against the Blastoise I get returned, so I knock it out, and now I have full health for the Espeon. But I am still asleep, so I'm going to have to go for Sleep Talk again. Espeon sets up Reflect because I'm at full health. Okay, that is promising. Uh, Sleep Talk selects Curse, which is really annoying. And then, because I'm tired, I make a mistake. I select Sleep Talk one more time. Pineco wakes up, doesn't do anything when it moved first with the Quick Claw, Espeon hits Psychic, and uh, yeah, it does a lot of damage, but not quite half. However, it lowers my special defense. Okay, fingers crossed, what I have to get here is a Quick Claw move first with Return, or I'm pretty sure the Espeon is going to KO me. And because the game hates me, the Quick Claw doesn't work, Espeon hits Psychic, and Pineco fates. However, the game doesn't hate me that much because in the very next fight, the Quick Claw activates against the Charizard and I take it out. This is actually the most health that I made it to the Snorlax with, which is really nice. I set up completely, heal up with rest, and then knock it out. Now Blastoise is next, but because of how much health I have, I can survive one hit from the Espeon, so I'm just going to go for Return. And because I have higher health, the Blastoise sets up Rain Dance first, allowing me to KO it for free. Last, Red sends in Espeon. Because I have high health, it sets up a Reflect, allowing Pineco to hit Return. And with that, I have finally beat the game. Pineco clocks in with a time of 3 hours, 33 minutes, and 8 seconds, with 42 resets at level 90. This took 11 hours and 51 minutes of game time. So after this playthrough, I just sat back and I was like, I really don't want to do a second playthrough. However, I am really committed to getting as accurate results as are possible within a game where there's like player error and RNG. So I optimized Pineco, and I actually went back in and did the second playthrough in the same day. Yes, I spent nine hours of one of my days focusing exclusively on this strange bug Pinecone. So there wasn't actually a lot to optimize in the early game, but the most important thing was just make sure that I'm spending enough money on potions. That way when I do the training to get rapid spin, I'm not worried about running out of healing items. By the way, in this playthrough I delayed fighting Bugsy. I might as well do it at a higher level just to have a little bit more consistency. After that I finish off my training, deplete my PP, use some of my healing items to replenish my health, and this prepares me to take on the rival. Now I wish there was some magic that I could apply to this playthrough to make this fight consistent, but at level 26 it just isn't. I am outspeeding the Ghastly now consistently with 28 speed, but the real problem is Quilava, like it can burn me which happens in my first fight, and then in the second fight it burns me again. Like. Are you kidding me? Normally with this kind of bad luck, I would restart the playthrough, but uh, it took me 40 minutes to get to this point, so I really don't want to restart. Now another complicating matter in this fight is that I don't have the guaranteed 2 hit on the Quilava. I could have, say, gone up to level 28 or level 30 to make this fight more consistent, but I really thought it wouldn't be worth it. Going into level 26 gives me the speed I need, and I figured that I would eventually get the range, knock the Quilava out, and proceed with some good luck. But yeah, today I failed to get the roll in my third fight, so that is another reset for Pineco. 
Thankfully, in the fourth fight, I do get the two hit, and as a result, I'm able to defeat the rival and progress to Goldenrod City. This time, it's easy for Pineco. I'm not relying on rollout. Instead, I'm using headbutt. This is just far more consistent, and it gives me the flexibility to use protect whenever mill tanks rollout is stacking up, and by doing that, I take an easy win on my first attempt. Now, in my second playthroughs of Johto, I use hidden power, so I had to decide on which type would be best for Pineco. By the way, on the way to get it, I'm going to fight all of the trainers, because Pineco Pineco really needs the training for the late game. So I think here the hidden power typing is quite obvious. I need a ground type move. This will help me counter Gengar on Karen's team, as well as her Houndoom. Honestly, it doesn't do anything to help against Charizard, but really what I would need for that would be speed. After all, I already have enough damage against it with return. So next is the rival in Burned Tower, and of course Hidden Power Ground is very useful here. I can take out the Haunter with ease, it also helps against the Quilava, and it really helps against the Magnemite. Next is Morty. For this fight, I plan to be level 40. It gives me the outspeed on the first Ghastly, and a speed tie with the second Haunter. I win the speed tie. You can see here that I'm not using the Hard Stone this time, instead I have the Mint Berry. That allows me to wake up from sleep against the Gengar, and then I knock it out. So Morty is no problem. Now Chuck is next, and he should be easy. That is, if the Polyrath doesn't get a Hypnosis after surviving on a sliver of health, and then Pineco stays asleep way too long, and the Polyrath actually lands four Surfs, knocking me out. Now this Polyrath dealing damage four turns in a row is so unlikely, plus I planned so that Pineco is faster than it. This way I can flinch with Headbutt, but then in the second fight, I don't cause a flinch on the second turn, Hypnosis hits again, and the luck from the previous fight directly repeats again. The Polyrath hits four Surfs in a row and Pineco goes down. At this point, like I'm watching the footage and I'm like, very disappointed. I did everything that I could. I have fought basically every trainer up until this point in this game. I planned to outspeed the Polyrath. I planned to use Headbutt for the flinch. And uh, yeah, I guess it wasn't enough. Luckily for me, I am able to defeat Chuck in my third attempt against him. I guess one small optimization that I could have made here was doing the rocket plotline first. After all, in here there are all these security cameras. Every time you walk in front of one of the pedestals, two rocket members will fight you. And there are a total of five of these locations, meaning there are a total of ten battles this way on the first floor. Normally, I skip the eight optional battles, but uh, today I'm going to do all of them with Pineco to get as much experience as is possible. By the way, this is the first time in any playthrough that I have fought more than just the first two rockets here. All of this experience brings Pineco almost up to level 50 before price. Of course here, rollout is uh, a very swift way to win. I did forget the hard stone, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Price is just terrible. Okay, so now it's time for Jasmine. With all this training, I am level 50, and I also have hidden power ground, so I can one hit the Magnemites and three hit the Steelix. Because of that, there's not really anything to worry about, and I take an easy first attempt victory. So Claire's next. She's really easy. Return one hits all the Dragonairs. I'm level 57 after all. I think this might be the highest level that I've ever been to defeat Claire. I'm sure some of you have more awareness about what happened in my very old videos. Uh, let me know if I was ever a higher level, but at least in recent memory, when I've been playing on four times game speed, this has been the highest level I've been to defeat her. On the way to Victory Road, I defeat all of the optional trainers for more experience. And then by the time I beat the rival before the league, who's very easy with hidden power, it really helps against Pokemon like the Magneton, I am level 63. So in this fight against Will, you can see that my level jumped up. That's because I went back and did more training in that patch of grass with the little house beside it where you can heal. This is so that I outspeed Will's first Zatu with 92 speed. I did consider going up to level 69 or 70 to move first against the Jinx, but in the end I figured that it wasn't really needed. Now, you'd think that Koga, who's next, would be easy, but uh, unfortunately for me, he sends out Crobat first, it uses Toxic, and as a result I'm not able to knock the Fortress out in time, and Pineco goes down once. Last week I had a comment on my Dratini video saying this felt like much less optimized than my normal playthroughs, so that kind of goes against how I was feeling because I was very proud of my route with Dratini. It just so happens that with a slow growth rate Pokemon, it ends up being very hard to shave time off, especially with a first stage Pokemon, because you have to do so much training. And of course that scenario is the same with Pineco. Plus, Dratini had really bad luck against Agatha, and that is replicated here with Pineco, because it is getting bad luck in now three different locations. The Rival, Chuck, and now Koga. I wish I could say that I defeated him on my second attempt, but uh, no, once again, the poison gets me. And yeah, then in the third fight, 
I hit return, it just barely doesn't knock the crowbat out, and it poisons me. Like, I can't even believe that. That is so frustrating. To stall me out, the fortress uses protect. That's very awful. I take so much poison damage, the last of which leaves Pineco on one hit point. Now, uh, here's the thing. Muck is last, I use hidden power ground, and it knocks it out. You don't take poison damage on the last turn of battle, so I actually just barely managed to make it through this fight. I think my initial playthrough failed to warn me just how hard Koga could be, because I didn't get poisoned then. If I had known that this was going to be an obstacle, I think I would have leveled more, but like, we're more than two hours into this new playthrough, so there's no way I'm going back to the beginning now. Of course, Bruno is quite easy for Pineco, so let's talk about Karen. She's not consistent because her Umbreon is usually going to either get off Confuse Ray or Sand Attack. In this case, it's Sand Attack, I miss on the Houndoom, and uh, that's it. But when I don't miss on the Houndoom, I'm able to successfully get to the Vile Plume. And here you'll note that I don't have Rest. That's because I don't really need it. After all, I can just one-shot the Vile Plume with Return. Next is Gengar. It is going to attack, but it's only impactful if it uses Destiny Bond. In this case, it doesn't, and I knock it out with one hit from Hidden Power Ground. Last is Murkrow. It can do a little bit of damage with Faint Attack, not enough to knock me out. And as a result, I take care of it. Last is Lance. The strategy here, of course, is roll out with the Hearthstone. If I miss, I'm gonna lose. That happens to me in the first battle. And then the Aerodactyl flinches me a ridiculous number of times with its illegal rock slide. In the next fight, I did miss roll out one more time at the critical moment, and Dragonite knocked me out with Blizzard. But then in the third fight, I do finally manage to connect when I need to, and Pineco defeats Lance. So now before I face Blue, I want to mention a psychological difference between Playthrough 1 and Playthrough 2. In Playthrough 1, there's sort of like a fog of war. You have no idea what level you're going to need to defeat Red. As a result, saving rare candies until the very last moment is sometimes key to prevent time training in the late game. However, in a second playthrough, with Pineco I know that I can't outspeed the Charizard, so because of that, I don't want to level up past level 90, so I can use the rare candies earlier on before Blue to take me up to level 88 for this fight. The strategy here is fairly simple, set up with Curse, sweep with Return, against the Gyarados I had to get a little bit careful to ensure that I had enough health for the rest of the fight, so I heal up, knock it out, and after that, it's an easy sweep. So there's one rare candy outside of Mount Silver that I pick up, and then I do a little bit of training to take me up to level 89, and then this final rare candy bumps Pineco up to level 90 for red. Of course here, I have to use the exact same strategy that I used last time, which is the Quick Claw against Charizard. I also realized that there is a way to basically ensure that I have full health for the Charizard, and that's stalling the Venusaur out. This thing really doesn't have very much PP, Sunny Day, Giga Drain, and Synthesis all only have 5 uses, and Solar Beam only has 10. Because Rest only drains PP once every 3 turns, it's easy to stall out, Venusaur starts using Struggle, doing very little damage because of my defense boosts, and then I knock it out. Charizard is next, moment of truth, Pineco moves first, hits with return, and knocks it out. Okay, so I basically got it from here. Snorlax is a 1 hit, Blastoise is a 1 hit, Espeon's last, he goes for Reflect, I hit return, and Pineco has done it. It clocks in with a time of 2 hours, 43 minutes, and 32 seconds, with 11 resets at level 90. This took 10 hours and 20 minutes of game time. So I was able to save 50 minutes of real time, and I clocked in with a lower game time, an hour and a half lower. That's just because I was more efficient, didn't need as much backtracking, and wandering around. I finished at the same level, and I had significantly less resets, so I I guess I'm really happy with this result, even though Pineco did not perform very well, as was expected. But what spot does it earn in my Generation 2 tier list? Well, this is the worst result that I have got so far, so today, Pineco earns itself a spot in the Bruno tier. Now, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon and through YouTube memberships. Your financial contributions mean more to me now than ever, because I've been experiencing some health problems. I've tweeted about it a little bit over the past month, but if you didn't already know, my voice has really been having some problems keeping up with the amount that I need to record. 
Now, I'm not doing like nine hour days sitting in front of the microphone. If I was doing that, I would understand it. But even doing like a two hour recording is extremely hard for my voice. Also, I'll like talk for 15 minutes in my personal life to my fiance or my parents. And then my voice immediately just goes hoarse and starts sounding really bad. It's gotten to the point now where my voice will just give out when I say certain words. And I also recognize internally just by how I'm feeling that I can't make certain sounds. I'm not capable of yelling anymore, and I'm also not capable of singing. Needless to say, I have been uh, very concerned about this because I make my income by speaking. And there are also people who rely on me to make this income speaking, so uh, yeah, I'm taking this very seriously. As a result, I have put on hold my Patreon and YouTube membership series in Fire Red. I just can't produce those videos right now. I was hoping to get back to them this week because I took almost all of last week off from talking but it just wasn't enough, and after this Pineco recording, I know that I can't record the Blastoise video. Also, just a heads up, I'm not sure how this next week is going to play out, and if my voice is not feeling well enough, there will be no video next weekend. I really appreciate you understanding, so thank you so much for your support. Just know I've got an appointment with a specialist sometime next week, so hopefully we'll understand what's going on, and then after that there'll be a treatment plan that I can get on to hopefully get my voice back to 100%. Like, subscribe, ring the chime echo, and comment because I gotta try to read them all. If you support me, again, thank you so much. If you've made it this far in the video, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next one.